Thank you, and thanks very much indeed for the invitation. What a couple of acts to follow. Um, I actually live in Camden, so I feel like I want to go and find that bench and um, see if it actually fulfills its primary function as a bench, because it didn't look all that comfortable. Anyway, um, so data privacy and useful purpose. Can we get the best of both worlds? This is a really interesting, challenging question, I think, because privacy and purpose are often set up as though they are intention, as though they, you, if, you, if you want to be able to use the data, then privacy is dead, essentially, to, 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 to quote Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook. Um, and, and I think this is, this is definitely something that's reflected in, um, in the media. Um, I have included a couple of examples from Ireland here. I did a, did, did a bit of research. Um, uh, most of these are, are UK or US, but there are a couple of Irish examples here as well. This is the way that the narrative is set up generally um, in the media and, and by people commentating on this, privacy or use. If you're going to be using data, and you, particularly big data and AI technologies, that privacy essentially is kind of dead, that you can't, you can't uphold privacy whilst being able to do exciting, interesting things with data. Um, and, and this is happening all the time, and I, and I think it's fair to say that uh, in light of Facebook, Cambridge Analytica, um, in light of GDPR and people becoming more aware of their rights as data subjects, um, this kind of narrative is only gaining more and more traction. But the thing is, do these things have to be intention? We tend to see that, as I say, they're, they're an either or that you've got to, to weigh them up against each other. Um, but actually, what I'm going to try and do in the time I've got today is make the case for the fact they don't need to be weighed up. That In fact, you can bring privacy and useful purpose together in ways that are mutually beneficial. And I'm going to draw on the, uh, the expertise of our information commissioner in the UK, Elizabeth Denham. She's our data protection regulator, the information commissioner. Um, and since uh, she's, she's come in from Canada, and, and since she's been in place, she's been very, very vocal on the fact that actually data protection is something that can be enabling, it can be facilitative. It's not just about clamping down on uses of data. That you can put these things hand in hand. And she said, and this was particularly in relation to um, a case that happened in the UK uh, of data sharing between um, a company called DeepMind Health, which is owned by Google, um, and a, a, a hospital trust. And the ICO ended up looking into this particular case. All sorts of fascinating connotations I'll happily go into in the, in the questions later. But she said, look, privacy does not have to be the price we pay for innovation. You can do these things together. And in actual fact, her argument very strongly is that they, they've got to go together. So that's her, that's her position, and I'd like to just spend a bit of time talking, talking about that um, and going through it. How do we manage to do these things together? And I think there are, are four real ways in which privacy and, and being able to use data for useful purposes can actually go hand in hand. And I'm talking specifically about health data here, and, and for understanding patient data, the initiative I work for, I'm talking specifically about data that's collected as a routine part of care. So not necessarily stuff you're bringing from your apps and your wearables and so on, although I'm aware that, as, you know, as Joel pointed out, there's an awful lot of data that's being collected in those contexts, but data that's collected as a routine part of care where your health professional, your clinician, has a, has a duty to, to protect and look after that. So I think that there are these four things. I'm going to focus on, 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 on two of them, but I, I, I will just quickly go through all of them. Um, I think you can get the best of both worlds if you can fulfill these, these kinds of criteria. So safeguards and governance. How do we get the best of? There we go. Good governance. Good governance, I think, is tremendously powerful. And by governance, I mean more than just law. The law is a very blunt instrument. It's, it's, as you know from GDPR, which we've heard a lot about today, um, it's very wide-ranging. It covers all sorts of sectors. It is necessarily quite a blunt instrument. So, so governance, I think, goes beyond legislation. And as Sorka pointed out, there are multiple regulators in the health data space. There are a lot of people who have some kind of oversight or can make rules and decisions and so on um, about the way that health data is used. So, so that's a challenge. It's also incredibly difficult for regulation and governance to keep up with advances in, in technology, and particularly in data science, which is advancing at such a rapid pace. It's very, very difficult to kind of be on the front foot with the rules about how data is used. However, I would say that good governance can actually facilitate really good, exciting, innovative uses of data. One of the things that's come through in the people that we've been speaking to, ranging from academic researchers to SMEs and startup companies, right through to the tech giants, is that, look, if you tell us the rules of the game, we will play by them. 
if you can be clear on what is allowed and what isn't, what processes we need to follow, what rules there are, we will follow them and then actually you can innovate and do brilliant things with data. Um, but at the moment that's, that's quite challenging to do. Technological developments can also help protect privacy. There's lots of advances happening in privacy-enhancing technologies, homomorphic encryption, and all kinds of exciting things around differential privacy and so on. Um, and I will talk a little bit about why some of those can be challenging, um, but they can actually help in this context as well. And also sanctions, sanctions and deterrence and redress. Uh, these are things that, certainly from the research that we've done, can really help protect and promote public confidence in the uses of data. Um, reference was made earlier to a report that we did a couple of years ago on attitudes towards commercial access to data. And that was one of the things that people really wanted to see. If you do something wrong with data, you will pay. You will be punished. And that really does help give people a sense of assurance about the way that the health data can be used. So governance and sanctions, I think, are, are really important. But the thing I particularly want to focus on is the other side of the equation, and that's transparency and informed choice. And note, I didn't say consent, and I'll explain why in a moment. This is a quotation from our National Data Guardian, Dame Fiona Caldicott, the uh, original author of the Caldicott Principles. Her responsibility is to ensure that data that's collected as part of healthcare is protected, that patients' interests are protected, but also that it's used effectively. We've had numerous incidents um, in England and Wales in particular where health data hasn't been used even for the purposes of an individual's care. And as a result, people die, people are, have le definitely less than optimal care. And she said a couple of years ago in a report, we have not taken the public with us in these discussions and we need their views. She's talking about the potential for using data for research for purposes beyond care. We need to have them with us, otherwise they'll be unwilling to share data with the people to whom they turn for care. And that will be the last thing we want to happen in our health service. So her point was that the public trust aspect is absolutely vital to get right. And I think that from all the, all the uh, presentations I've seen here today, you know, that's, that's kind of taken as a given, right? We know that the public trust and confidence bit's really, really important. It's important for, pa for patients, but it's also incredibly important for being able to actually do things well with data. Um, and this is a report that came out earlier this year from our House of Lords. Um, they had a committee on AI in the UK. And they were looking across multiple sectors, but they were particularly interested in health, given lots and lots of excitement about the potential for AI in healthcare. And it, one, one of the interesting things that came out of that was just how important it was going to be to be able to have public trust and confidence to use AI in healthcare. If you look at the, the, the four criteria they set out for the benefits of AI in healthcare, what, what's needed, acceptance by the public of AI playing a role, the use of patient data, the NHS being equipped to deploy technology, and staff trained how to use it. At least three of those are utterly people-centered, both for patients and for staff and clinicians. Without those, we're not going to be able to get the benefits. So not only do we want patients to have the assurance and, and feel like they understand and are confident in the way data is used, but you're not going to be able to, to roll out these advances in AI and healthcare without that, those people-centred um, aspects in place. So we just need to explain to people, right? We just need to say, look, this is what happens to your data. This is how it's used. Tell them a little bit about, you know, exciting, whizzy bits of data science. I'm afraid it's not that simple. Um, for a start, people, as a default, don't understand very much about how data is used. Now, obviously, in the context of this audience, you're all highly educated in the uses of data uh, for health research. But the fact is, the general population do not think about this stuff. They don't particularly care about it unless and until they see one of those headlines I flagged up earlier, at which point they will get very, very anxious very, very quickly. So you're starting from a point of people not really knowing much about data, even for their own care, let alone for any other purpose. And what you tend to find is people start from a position of not really knowing anything. You tell them a little bit, and they absolutely panic. They say, you're doing what with my data? You didn't ask for permission. Who's using it? Where's it going? Why didn't I have a say in this? Is it being sold? And the, the anxiety level absolutely peaks. And for those of you who uh, have heard of care.data back in the UK um, a few years ago, the care.data debacle, as it's formally known now, um, I think we absolutely hit that peak. Told people a little bit about the way that data could be used, didn't answer any of their questions, didn't have clear answers about governance and who was actually using the data or what it was for. 
And so people were really worried. And as a result, the whole program got shut down. Now, what we have found in the research that we've done, and this, this does come from the commercial access report that was mentioned earlier, the one-way mirror, it tends to be the case that if you can explain things to people in a way that is meaningful, accessible, and engaging, their anxiety will tend to drop. And in fact, they can end up being quite supportive. So this quote, which came from a focus group, summarizes this little journey very nicely. I knew nothing about this until today. At first, I was concerned, but now I've heard more, I'm reassured. And more to the point, they actually became a really strong advocate for the use of data for purposes beyond care. And this was in an NHS context in the UK. So you can get to that point where people are actually really supportive and think this is fantastic. But it's really, really hard to do this. I hate to say it, but data is pretty dry. It's pretty technical. It's pretty complex. It's full of jargon. Terms like anonymization don't really mean a lot to people, especially pseudonymization, which is even worse. Um, it's, it's pretty hard to do this in practice. And the problem that that leads to is that people end up feeling like this. It's a one-way mirror. They, the nebulous they, it's always kind of a nebulous they, know everything about you. We don't know what they're doing with that. The anxiety, the fear that comes through when you start talking about the way that data and health records could be used is, is astonishing. Um, and, and because you don't have a lot of this information, people do get very anxious. So as part of understanding patient data, we were set up to try and address this challenge. This challenge of how on earth do you go about explaining to people and informing them about the way that data that's collected as part of healthcare can be used for purposes other than their own care. And we drew on a lot of the attitudes, public attitudes research that has been done, mostly focused in the UK, but also abroad as well, to identify a few key questions. These are the things that people want to know. And they are questions that if you are conducting research that's using data that's collected in a clinical context, you should be able to answer. Why is it important? What happens to it? What are the risks? What choices do I have? How is data kept safe? Where can I find out more? Is the data identifiable? Why do companies need it? These sorts of questions. Now, OK, we've set out the questions. Fairly straightforward to answer them, right? Again, sorry, it's actually pretty challenging, <laughs> as, you may, as you may have gathered. We have spent the last couple of years developing a series of tools and resources to try and help with this conversation. And the language is so important in all of this. Even the term data sharing sounds pretty scary to someone who's not heavily involved in this world. Because sharing sounds like you're just kind of handing it out. But actually, you know, what you're doing is you're enabling access to data under specific circumstances for specific reasons. And the worst thing you can say in a kind of patient uh, and public uh, context is hackathons. Don't talk about hackathons, please, whatever you do. Even though, from a data science perspective, they're really exciting and cool. Right? Never talk about hacking. So we've developed some tools and resources, including um, we've got an animation series that talks through um, numerous different kinds of conditions and a patient journey through the healthcare system, how data about them is collected and then used for research purposes. We've got ones that kind of have a big picture. We've got one on cancer, diabetes, heart attack, dementia. I always forget the dementia one. Um, and so this animation series is, is just like two or three minutes. We've got them up in GP surgeries, in community pharmacies. Researchers are using them on their websites. Everything we've produced is available on a Creative Commons license. Please use it if it's helpful in the context that you're working in. Um, not very tech savvy, we have a patient data wheel. I've got one here. Super simple. It is a little wheel that has seven categories of ways in which patient data can be used in language that's really understandable, accessible. We've road tested it. And for each of these, you can spin the wheel and find out how data is used. And it's got a couple of examples, the details of which we have on our website. They have little case studies. This is the way that patient data can be used for really great purposes. And the advantage of doing something like this is it can showcase just how useful the data can be, and in a way that people can just kind of get and understand, in a way that's quite simple. And if they want to know more, if they want to have more detail, they can find it. That information is accessible and very simple and straightforward to find. We've also developed, in conjunction with um, a, a patient uh, group called Use My Data, um, a group of uh, patients, particularly those with cancer, who are really passionate about making the data that's about their condition useful for research. We've developed this citation, which is starting to be used um, by researchers. It's now default for, it's in some um, funder policies now that you have to cite this. If you're using information that's collected as part of healthcare, and obviously this is an NHS uh, emphasis, um, 
that you cite that, whether that's in a press release or as an acknowledgement in your um, academic articles and papers, just to help make clear this has come from somewhere and we're, we're really grateful um, for the patients and the clinicians who've contributed to this, to this research. Um, we've got explainers about safeguards and risks and benefits and so on. Um, and also this really tricky one, which is about identifiability. Trying to explain to someone whether the data is identifiable, whether it's personal data or not, is really not easy. And that's in part because it's not always clear cut. Now, much as GDPR has a very clear dividing line, data is either personal or it's not personal, as those of us who work in this space will know, that is not a very clear cut line. There is a big gray area in the middle depicted by our nice fuzzy photo there, where it could be identifiable, it might not be, depends on the context, depends on what other data you've got that you could potentially add to it, depends on the data environment and security and so on. It's not an easy thing to say whether data counts as personal or not. So again, we have a kind of explainer in, uh, about you know, whether or not data is, counts as personal data. And the key thing about this is it's on a spectrum. So it shows that it's not clear cut one or the other. Again, trying to just help make people more aware of, um, of some of these challenging issues using a language that is straightforward and understandable. The images have been really powerful. The language, not so much, but the images have been very, very effective in trying to explain this. So how do we get the best of both worlds? I talked earlier about the, kind of the governance side and the, and the sanctions, and then more about the kind of communication and transparency. If you can provide clear, accessible explanations why are you using the data? What's the purpose? Who's going to be using it? And people are anxious about commercial access. But if you can explain why a company is using the data, why they have the expertise, why they can provide something that you couldn't just get in the health service or research, then actually people do tend to support it and say, yeah, that, that makes sense. So long as there is more public benefit than, than exploitation or private uh, benefit accruing, people will tend to be supportive. Not everyone, but people will tend to be supported. What kind of data are you talking about? When you talk about data sharing, people have this idea that you've got an entire manila envelope that's just being passed to someone else. Their entire medical history. You can explain about what kind of data we're talking about here. Then again, that can help reduce the anxieties. And how? How is it being protected? How is it being safeguarded? And in a world of AI and, and, and new technologies and so on, um, that's actually a really, really important thing to try and get right. People treat it as a hygiene factor. They don't necessarily want to know all of the details of the governance and the safeguards you've got. They just want to know someone's looking after it and it's being protected and someone's thinking about how to ensure that they're protected. Something that's also come through very, very clearly for us is just how important it is to be honest about risk. You can be very easily disingenuous by saying, don't worry, your data is 100% safe with us and you are just inviting a breach or something to be hacked. But from all the research that we've done and that we've looked at, if you can be transparent and honest about the fact there are risks involved in this, there are going to be risks to your confidentiality if you're using data that's drawn from your health record. Um, but we think that that's a risk that's worth taking, given that there are going to be enormous benefits from the amount of research you could do. People will tend to get that and say, OK, well, I understand there's, there's pros and cons, you know. As there is with everything we do in life, there are risks associated with you know, going, getting on the bus. Um, we don't pretend that these things are 100% safe. And the same should be said of health data. People are much more capable of having an honest conversation than you might give them credit for, if you can approach them in a meaningful, accessible way that speaks their language and not yours. And finally, choices. This is a really interesting one, because actually in a lot of cases, when it comes to the use of our data, we don't have choices. I don't get to decide whether my data about my tax record goes to the tax ban or not. It's a part of functioning in an in a, in a existing society that some data about you gets shared and gets used. And that's okay. But where you do have choices, it's really helpful to explain those. So we did a lot of work earlier this year on something called the National Data Opt-out which came into force at the same time as GDPR on the same day. Um, and this is a, a system where, um, by default, data from your personal health records will be used for research purposes unless you opt out. And the opt out is very easy. It's very straightforward. You go to a website. We have an app, an NHS app, coming out soon that you'll be able to opt out via that as well. But the default is your data will be used unless you make a decision not to. 
And we put a lot of work into the language of that opt-out to explain to people, this is what the data is for, this is how it's used, here, here's where you can go to find out um, you know, any questions you have. Um, but explaining that in a really straightforward way took a long time. And actually, for the, all of those people who previously had opt-outs, letters went round to, to all of them, over 1.2 million. Um, and actually what was found was that uh, there was a decrease in opt-outs. So a lot of the people who had previously opted out of their data being used, when they got this information, changed their minds and opted back in. The key thing here, and I think this draws very much on Linda's point earlier, was that data use has to be navigable and visible. And what I don't mean there is we must educate everyone. It's, easy, it's very easy to say something should be in the curriculum. We've got to educate the children about this. But that's really hard. And it also places a lot of burden on people to take on board what is a very complex set of information. Technically, the terms and conditions that you all sign up to when you use any kind of app, that's transparency, right? It's transparent how the data is used. In no way is that meaningful. And in the same way, I think we have to be very careful when we're talking about how data is used to make it as simple and straightforward and understandable as possible without placing a huge burden on people to go and find out an awful lot of information and get their heads around the technicalities of it all. So making data use visible and navigable, and that onus is on those who are developing and using the data to be able to make that as simple and straightforward as possible. So that's how I think we can get the best of both worlds. But I just want to end with a little caveat, because I was, I was asked to talk about privacy and, and useful purpose. I actually don't think that privacy is the biggest thing we have to worry about here. It's very easy when we're talking about the use of data to get in a tunnel vision with privacy and consent and think that that's the big thing we've got to focus on. Ethical considerations, it's all about privacy and consent and anonymization, and, and that's, the, that's the big ethical issue. Actually, when it comes to the use of big data, in healthcare and, and beyond the use of big data in society, there are far bigger, harder ethical considerations at play than privacy. The way that big data, AI, technology, and particularly machine learning, are going to be used, they're being used now, but they're going to be used in future, there are some enormous questions about equity, about fairness. Who gets access to the benefits? Who's discriminated against as a result of using algorithms and potentially when they can be opaque and it's very hard to understand how they've come to decisions? You know, GDPR does have uh, provisions about automated decision-making, and I think those are going to absolutely blow up in the next few years. Is there bias? Does everyone get represented? What happens when people are missing from the data sets that you're using to develop algorithms? They're just invisible. Solidarity is a concept that we have in our health service, whereby you're getting something for your, your, tax, your tax money, but you know, there's, a, there's a sense of, in which... For, this, for a socialised healthcare system, you do have a, a kind of strong solidarity. You might not necessarily get a benefit out of it, but you want other people to benefit. How do we, how do we judge these things? How do we balance these in the context of, of the massive use of data? Public goods and commercial interests, we, there isn't a societal conversation quite yet about what the reasonable role of companies is in using data that's derived from public services and publicly available data and how they can make a profit and what that means for, for you and I as, and society. So whilst I would say that we can get the best of both worlds when it comes to privacy and being able to use data for great purposes, we can get the best of both worlds. But I also think we need to give far more consideration to what kind of world we actually want at the end of it all. Thanks very much.